Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of the Congregation of St. Paul's United Church of Christ, I would like to welcome you to our worship service this morning. For those who are comfortable doing so, where you see the asterisk in the bulletin, we invite you to stand. As we gather to praise and draw closer to God, we'd like to highlight a few opportunities for service, study, and outreach in the life of our faith community. You will find more details about these announcements as well as others in your bulletin. We encourage you to take your bulletin home with you to read through. First, the 2014 Child Sponsorship and Altar Flower Sponsor sign-up sheets are on the table in the Commons. We have quite a few dates open and ask that you please consider sponsoring. There are envelopes for your payment and also cards on the tables that you can use to notify someone that you sponsored a child and or the altar flowers in their name. The 2014 offering envelopes are also in the commons. If you've not picked up yours yet, please do so today. If you have any questions, please see Terry in the church office. Please also check out all the sign-up sheets in the commons, including the St. Paul's on a Mission winter soup sale and helping in the nursery. Let us now turn our attention to the presence of God within us and amongst us here. Let us join our hearts and spirits in worship.
Come, let us join together in worship. And during this week of prayer for Christian unity, may we envision our sisters and brothers in faith also gathering together. May we strive to find ways to work with one another. For in all our diversity, we recognize our mutual desire to witness to God's love shown in Jesus through our loving words and actions offered in gratitude. Let us join our hearts and spirits in worship. Understandably, we do not want to draw people to our particular way of offering service by putting others down. Unfortunately, that often stops us altogether from witnessing or sharing with others why we serve in the ways we do. 
Let us join in the unison prayer of confession. Giving God, we confess our unease, our fear of speaking with others about why we feel moved to serve. While we know you don't want us just showing off, we also know our personal witness can be very powerful in drawing others to you. Please forgive our hesitancy. God keeps sharing God's love in all sorts of different ways, through all sorts of different people, whether we choose to talk about it or not. Let us commit to being more generous, not only in how we offer ourselves, but how we show and tell others why we engage in such giving behavior. Now, please, if you will, turn to your neighbor, pass the peace of Christ. to add our prayers to them with the hope that they will one day reach someone who will be touched by all that is within them and will remember that they are loved by God. Let us join in the unison prayer of blessing. <clears throat> May God's grace be upon me, Shaws, warming, comforting, enfolding, and embracing. May these mantles be safe havens, sacred places of security and well-being, sustaining and embracing in good times as well as difficult ones. May the ones who receive these shawls be cradled in hope, kept in joy, graced with peace, and wrapped in love. Blessed be. This morning, and we're going to talk about something today that everybody has. We're going to talk about eyes. <laughs> As I take off my glasses, we're going to talk about eyes. Okay. Do you ever think about your eyes? About what you see? You think about your eyes a lot? You can see a church. Hmm? Kind of. You can see. 
Okay, you can see your parents out there. We can, okay, we can see all kinds of things <laughs> sitting from here that we probably can see things from sitting here that they can't see you facing this way, right? Yeah. Well, today we're gonna to talk a little bit though. Did you ever wonder what it would be like if you had super power eyes? <laughs> no, you never thought about that. Now, I don't know my superheroes very well, but I'm sure there's probably a superhero that has special vision eyes where they can see things that normal people's eyes can. Some people have, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's a superhero that has x-ray powers, but their eyes, they can see through walls and see things that we can't see. How about, but other than superheroes, I often thought about, would it be cool if I could see through the back of my head? I could see what was behind me and beside me instead of just what was in front of me? Mothers are saying yes, <laughs> nodding. Would it be fun to be able to see what was behind you at the same time you could see what was in front of you? Would that be, you think that'd be fun? No. No, no. Yes. yes? Yeah. And you think of any other superpowers that you might, with your eyes, that you might like to have, yeah? Future. Wow, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Well, when I was thinking about my superpowers this week, I came up with the ultimate superpower, and it's called the lost and found eyes. It meant that any time I lost something, all I had to do was tell my eyes to find it, and it would go right to it. Do you think that would come in handy? Superpower hut. Find that lost shoe on your way out the door, or your mitten, or your homework, or in my case, my glasses, which I'm always losing. Wow, it's fun to think about what cool things we'd have if we had superpowers in our eyes. And, um, and it's also some, it's cool to think about the things that we can do with our eyes that are really, really special. And in today's Bible lesson, gospel lesson that Reverend John will read, we talk, there's, um, Jesus is, is starting his ministry. He's just been baptized by John the Baptist, and John the Baptist has been introducing John to people around him and inviting people to come and hear him. And the people have a lot of questions. Who is this guy? Is he really the one we're waiting for? Where does he live? What's he going to do? They have a lot of questions for Jesus. And when they go to him, and some of John's followers go to him and say, and say to Jesus, and they start asking all these questions, Jesus, instead of giving them a long story about where he came from and what he was planning to do, he just says this. He says, come and see. Come and see. Come and see what? Huh? Not quite sure. But he says that. He invites them to go with them so that, he, that those people can, that those followers can be part of his ministry, can be part of going out and sharing God's love. And, he, and I think Jesus thought it was a lot easier to show people than to just tell them about what he was going to do. And so the people started following him, and they started being part of Jesus' ministry, not just seeing what Jesus was doing, but also doing the work that Jesus was doing and doing the work to people around them. They were part of that exciting ministry. So I started thinking about that. I said, well, gosh. How can I be part of that ministry? Do you, think I'm, do you think we're part of that ministry today? Do you think Jesus invites us to be part of his ministry? <gasps> he does. Yeah. yeah, he does. He does. Even though, though Jesus was with John the Baptist and all his followers almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus still invites us today to be part of that exciting thing, to, to go out and share God's love. Now, how do we do that? And especially because we're talking about eyes today. How do we use our eyes to go out and share God's love? Any ideas, Philip? No? Okay. I saw a hand over here. Do you have yes. Okay. All right. You see your parents? Okay. Well, you know what? We can share God's love with our parents and our family. Can we? When you see them, do you smile? Do you give them hugs? If they're having a bad day, do you ever give them hugs? <laughs> Try it. I think you'll like it. Okay? What about, what about if you were at school and you had a friend who was just having a horrible day and things weren't going right and maybe he's just, they're just having a bad day. What could you do? You've been there? Yeah. <laughs> I think we've all been there. 
And what is it that we can do to make you feel better? Be a friend? Come over and say hi to you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good, that's good, yeah. Well, you know what? That's part of sharing God's love. When we see people who need our help and who need our friendship, and what, even just things around the house, like if your brothers are giving you a bad time, more or better yet. Maybe your brothers need your help. Maybe they're having a project and they just can't seem to get it right and it's something you're good at. Maybe you could do that. Maybe you could see with those eyes that you could be of help and you could share your gifts with them. Huh? Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what about and I was coming into church and I said, I'm going to use my eyes when I come into church to see how I can see, how I can help share God's word. And you know what I saw before I came into church? I saw a grocery cart. Did anybody see a grocery cart when you came into church? Why do we have a, why do we have a grocery cart in our church? Okay, that's right. You know, was that what you were going to say? Yeah. That, that what you were going to say? Yeah. Now, what were you going to say? We have a grocery mart, but it's not really hidden in our church. How do you think that grocery cart gets full? <coughs> when people bring things, they see the cart. They're reminded that there are people in our world that need our help, and we can use our eyes and our, and our legs and our arms to help share God's love that way. Hmm. So we might not have special superpowers with our eyes, but we certainly could use our eyes to do super special things in sharing God's love, can't we? Let's try this week to use our eyes to see people around us and see things around us that we can be of help, that we can share love, that we can bring joy, that we can do all those good things that Jesus wants us to do. Can we try to do that? Okay, fine. Can, let's, let's close with a prayer. Can we hold hands? Can we hold hands? Everybody? Got one? Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for inviting me to be part of your beautiful world. Help me use my eyes to see where I can share your love with others. Amen. love has graced this planet in Jesus Christ and baptized, baptized us with the Holy Spirit, reawaken our eagerness to follow where Jesus leads, so we may fulfill the discipleship to which we are called, lead others to experience your steadfast love and faithfulness, and inspire them to delight in doing your will. Amen. Please listen for the word of God. The first reading comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. The servant's mission. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. 
Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations and slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Here ends the reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The second reading is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 40, verses 1 through 11. It's a psalm of thanksgiving for deliverance and prayer for help. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard me cr my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust. Do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Here I am, in the scroll of the book it is, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. Here ends the reading from the book of Psalms. May God bless our hearing and living of these words. Amen. God is still speaking. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When we say certain phrases or terms, and when we apply them to different people, we have some preset images in our heads about what that means. So in our third scripture passage today, um, John the Baptist 
says about Jesus or points out to his disciples that Jesus is the Lamb of God. He says, look, there goes the Lamb of God. Now, when we hear that, when we hear that phrase, the Lamb of God, our understanding goes to this idea that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, that Jesus is sacrificed so that our sins can be forgiven. That's, we've been trained to think that. But I wonder if that is not the full meaning of what John is pointing out. In fact, I wonder, particularly in this case, if that guides us away from that full meaning. Now, it's quite understandable that we should go in that direction. For the longest time, within Judaism, and in fact, within the religions of the Middle East, and I think if we cast our eye across the religions of the world, there is an idea that because the relationship between human beings and the divine is so unequal, if human beings want the divine to do something for them, protect them, help them out, defeat their enemies, if we want the divine to do that, then we have to offer something to the divine in order to get the divine to do what we want. It's a trade-off sort of thing. So in order to get the divine to do something big and important, we figure like we have to do something big and important. So, and what should that be? And there's this sense that in religions that God asks for humans to be servants, to give themselves to God. Well, people took that literally. Okay, well, if I'm supposed to give myself to God, then I guess that means I have to give my whole self to God, sacrifice myself to God, be killed for God. But people quickly realized they didn't really want to be killed <coughs> for God or for anybody else for that matter. So they would pick certain individuals, certain rather unlucky individuals. Look, we'll get this individual to stand in our place. We'll sacrifice this person to God instead of all of us doing that, and then God will do what we want. So human sacrifice was something that was fairly prevalent in many religions for a number of years. Within Judaism, and even within early Judaism, we don't know if it was practiced or not. What we do know is that there begins to be a movement away from that. And that's part of the Abraham story with Isaac. No, you don't have to sacrifice Isaac, your son, a human being. I will give you a lamb or a ram. Sacrifice that animal instead. Okay. People of Israel like that. Maybe we don't have to sacrifice people anymore. We'll sacrifice animals. And if we're pretty well off or if we really need a big favor from God, we're going to sacrifice the better animals. So we're going to get a lamb, the first lamb of the flock. This very valuable animal that provides meat will sacrifice that. And as time went on, this idea that lambs were sacrifices in lieu of human beings became to take hold to a greater, greater extent. But even within Judaism, there began to be a movement away from this idea that that's what God was really interested in. Sacrifice. We, even, we heard it in the psalm that Kevin read. God, you don't really desire the sweet smells of sacrifice. What, we re what you really want is for us to do justice, to share mercy, to offer ourselves to somebody else on your behalf, to help. That's what you want us to do. That's the offering you want us to make. So then we come to Jesus. And we have John the Baptist, who's already established a ministry of his own, and he's got followers, and he is trying to do the best that he can as far as understanding what God is saying to him and what God is asking him to do. 
Part of what God says is you're going to baptize Jesus when he comes to you. And when you see somebody who the Holy Spirit alights on, you'll know he's the one. So John has been on the lookout for this person, and he's found. And that's what we're encountering today. After Jesus' baptism and then John's reaction to that. So let us listen for the word of God as it's found in the gospel according to John. Reading from the first chapter. Verses 29 through 42. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of, the God, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah which is translated the anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. May God bless this reading from Holy Scripture. So we have John the Baptist. He's baptized Jesus. He thinks that, that Jesus, this person before him could very well be the Messiah. He's starting to believe this based on what he has understood that has come to him from God and what he's witnessed in his baptism. And so he's willing to not only come to believe that, but he's willing to say that out loud to other people. He's willing to say to his disciples, look, there goes the Lamb of God. And those other disciples, well, they, they stop following John and they go and follow Jesus. So John must have knew that this was a possibility, and yet he thought it was more important to point people in the direction of the one who he thought was the Son of God than to have his own followers. And, and so people, the disciples went. Now, they go to follow Jesus, and I think it's kind of an interesting thing that they should say to him, where are you staying? Kind of an interesting question, right? If you think you're following the Messiah, would that be your first question? So Jesus, where are you staying? The hotel down the street? I don't, I don't know. Unless, unless part of that question is to try to get a sense of if this is the Messiah, where does the Messiah stay? Has he a nice residence set up somewhere? Is it, is it a, a nice home or a nice palace or something like that? And if they're thinking that, they're in for a surprise because we know from the, the witness of Scripture that Jesus never stays in places like that. In fact, he sometimes doesn't even have a stone for a pillow, right? That's what we're... So 
when those disciples come and see, as Patty pointed out earlier, where he stays, they know that they're in for something very different than they expected. They come to understand that this person, this Jesus, who might be the Son of God, who might be the Messiah, is going to be something dramatically different than what they thought he was going to be based on what they had heard from Scripture. This great conquering hero who was going to kick out the Romans or anybody else that was occupying the land of Israel and bring Israel back to its former glory and power. Now, this guy was up to something else. And over the course of the time that they're together, they learn what he's up to. But we get locked into this image here in this early part of Jesus' ministry in which when we think, we hear John say, look, there goes the Lamb of God, and we think, oh, crucifixion, sacrifice, dying for our sins, that's what John is referring to. But what if it's not? What if John is saying, look, there goes God's offering to us. And it doesn't have anything to do with being crucified and then having our sins saved because of that. Rather, God's offering to us is this living, breathing human being who's going to show us how it is that we can be fully human. That's what he's going to do. God sacrifices God's divineness to be in human form. God sacrifices God's all-powerfulness to be in limited human form. God comes down and is incarnate in the world so we can learn how to be the best human beings we can be. God is showing us in the person of Jesus, teaching us in the person of Jesus' words how it is that we can live. That is what God is offering us. And God is showing us how it is that we too can be lambs of God. We're not being asked to be strung up on a cross. What God is saying to us is, if you can offer your life in service like Jesus offers his life in service, then you're doing exactly what I ask. In fact, that's what I've been asking people to do since the beginning. They just got a little confused. All I've ever wanted is for people to offer themselves in service to me by serving others. Now, it's not an easy life. It's not the life that everybody else chooses to lead, but it's the life I'm looking for you to lead if you're going to be connected to me, if you're going to follow me. I need you to be living a life of service. And that sometimes means you pay more attention to the prophets that are speaking and we hear their words through scripture and that we've heard through time, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, than you do to P-R-O-F-I-T-S. Now I know, seemingly all the rest of the people in the world, or a whole lot of the rest of the people in the world, are spending way more time thinking about that and how to increase those than those problems. But if you are going to be of service to me, God says, you're going to pay more attention to the prophets. And when the prophets speak, they remind you what I need you to do. Bring justice to the poor. Feed the hungry. House the homeless. Take care of those people who are struggling with illness. That's what God wants us to do. That's how we're supposed to be servants of God. And it's a concept that is sort of beyond our ability to fully comprehend. So what does God do? Well, here, I'll show you. Let me send Jesus down, and he'll show you how to do it. All right? So you don't have to imagine it now. I'll show you. And so what does Jesus do? He's not bumping, rubbing elbows with the rich and famous. He's hanging out with the tax collectors and the outcasts. 
He's not living in palaces. He's hanging out, living in the dirt, often. He is not mixing it up with all the religious authorities, except on occasion when they question him, and he answers their questions, and they don't like it. But he kind of shrugs his shoulders and says, this is what we're going to do. This is how God wants us to serve. And we've gotten off track on a few, in a few places on a few occasions. But I came here to try to help you all understand how we get back on track. You know, healing, healing's a big part of what we're called to do. And there should be no Sabbath from that. Don't really know how we got that concept going, but here, I'm going to heal on the Sabbath, you can too. Plenty of lessons like that along the way. That's Jesus being the Lamb of God. It's in his life. Not necessarily in his death. He is the example for how it is that we can offer our, offer our lives in service. Now maybe we, as hard as it is thinking about it, maybe it's a little bit easier for us to think about Jesus being the Lamb of God that one time up on the cross, sacrificed, no more, where sins are forgiven, okay, we're done. Doesn't require as much from us. But we know in our hearts that's not how God works. God does want us to be and live lives of service. God wants us to be lambs of God. Not sacrificing our lives in the sense of being killed, but sacrificing our lives in the way of giving, being, and living lives of service that help other people and are not all just about ourselves as individuals. Is that a sacrifice? Sure it is. Is that hard? Absolutely. The more we do it, the harder it gets. But it's also helping create the world that God has sought to create since the beginning. That's what God's been hoping for, looking for, asking for, and still is. So may we, as we hear that phrase, envision how it is that someone might say that about us. May we work on trying to figure out how it is that when we pass by, each of us as individuals and maybe a whole bunch of us as parts of this congregation and, and the congregation as a whole, when we pass by, someone might stop and go, you know what, look it. There's a Lamb of God. We're getting there. Amen.
names of people for whom we have concern. We'd ask that we might keep all these people in our hearts and prayers this day and in the coming days and in the coming weeks. <coughs> and if there are other concerns or celebrations you'd like to raise, I, I'd ask that we might do so at this time. Well, I have a celebration. My, um, as many people know, my dad had bypassed it, but he was at church today and um, is doing really well, and we thank everybody for prayers over the last couple of weeks. Thank you. Yes. A family friend of mine, of mine and my family, um, had a couple mini strokes the other day, and on Friday, Okay, and her name? Uh, Crystal. Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. Other concerns or celebrations? Then I'd ask that we might, in particular, keep in our prayers uh, Donna Cronister. Donna's home and doing better, but she's still feeling sore. She still has her stitches in, and they will remain in for about another week. So we could um, continue our prayers for Donna. Also, continued prayers for Megan Kern. Um, Megan was with us last weekend um, and started to feel ill. By the time she had gotten home, she was very ill, and she needed to be hospitalized. They finally diagnosed that um, she was suffering from pneumonia, and so they have been able to uh, begin to treat her for that. She's starting to feel a little better, her baby's okay, and she has been able to come home from the hospital. But if we could please continue to keep them both in prayers as they heal and recover. Also, if we could keep John Nisley in our prayers. Uh, John is going in for gallbladder surgery on Tuesday, uh, the 21st. Also, if we could please keep Kay Warren in our prayers. Uh, Kay is going in for surgery also on the 21st to have one of her hips replaced. So if you please keep Kay in prayers. <clears throat> Continued prayers for Jerry Rutherford. Uh, he is continuing to heal from his shoulder surgery um, and also the infection that developed after that continues to have to be on some pretty strong antibiotics. We pray for Jerry's recovery. Also, continued prayers for Phoenix and Shannon Trout. Uh, Phoenix had surgery on his eye this past week. The surgery went well, and he is in the process of recovering. Also, continued prayers for Ruth Wrightstone. Uh, Ruth is in rehab, spent the last week in rehab. She will be in rehab for another week, um, experiencing less pain in her hands. Uh, but some added pain where they did the procedure around her neck and um, undergoing a great deal of therapy um, in the morning and in the afternoon. So she uh, expressed her thanks and gratitude for all the prayers that were offered and also asked that if you want to be in touch with her, if you could um, either send a note or a card or call after 3 o'clock. We do have her room number and phone number at the, at the rehab center in um, in the office and we can give that to you. And finally, if we could keep G uh, Gene Shaner and all his family in our prayers, we have been offering prayers for his aunt, Pat Wagner, and, um, and Pat died this past Wednesday. So if we could please keep Gene and all his family in prayers. Let us join our hearts and spirits in prayer. Most gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for your presence within us and amongst us here. And we pray that we might draw the strength from that presence to serve as you would have us serve. We recognize on many levels how difficult that can be. We recognize that serving you by serving others can involve going against the stream can involve doing and saying things that can anger our friends and neighbors and co-workers and family members. And 
and yet you ask us to continue to stand up for justice, for the care of one and all, so that the world might one day look like you have envisioned it, in which the needs of all are cared for, in which all people have the opportunity and chance to live fulfilling and peaceful lives. Be with us that we might be your land, that we might offer ourselves to you in similar ways that you offered yourself to us. We believe that you hear the prayers that we offer to you aloud, and also those prayers that we offer to you in silence, and so now we turn to you in that silence. taught us many different things, including that you hear all our prayers and you respond to them. May we receive the care and the comfort, the peace and the love you're offering us, as well as the calls you place before us. We offer you this prayer and all our prayers in your most gracious and holy name, and in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Lord, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Amen. <coughs>
us join in the unison prayer of dedication. God of the saints in every age and time, we are grateful for the privilege of being numbered among them as we invest our gifts from you. Because of your generosity, we have not lacked for anything we really need. Grant now that our words and deeds may follow our offering into loving service in your realm. Amen.
it's important for us to tell the story or to tell our story about why it is that we do the things that we do. And hopefully people are noticing some of the things that we do in service for others. But telling the story about it can be a little tricky. Um, those of you who have seen me outside of the sanctuary know that often when I'm out, I have a baseball hat on. And recent, fairly, for the last few months, I've been wearing my Boston Red Sox hat. <laughs> So when people see that, or when some people see that, they right away get, ah, Red Sox fan, and, and you get into this kind of rap about the Sox, and this is great that they won the World Series and all that kind of stuff. And so we could talk about that. There's this entryway, and we can talk about how we're both Red Sox fans, or if you're Yankees fans, how much they hate the Red Sox. <laughs> you know how that would go. But I used to have a hat that had BS on it. <laughs> and people would stop and look at me and say, what does that BS stand for? And I would get to smile, and I would say, well, in actuality, it stands for Boiling Springs, where we live. But I'm a preacher, and some people think the BS stands for stuff I said. <laughs> now people would look at me and they would wonder. But often it provided an opening to talk a little bit about my faith. Why do what I do? They don't, those openings don't come up very often, but we have to be ready for them when they do. And we have to engage in work and activities or even goofy things like wearing baseball hats on occasion to pique people's interest to see if they'll ask us those questions. Because when they do, it is an opportunity for us to share, and it's an important opportunity for us to share. Because we as individuals and we as an individual church we can never accomplish everything that God needs to have done. It just can't happen. We need as many people as possible willing to be and live lives of service. And in order to draw people in, we gotta tell a story, our stories. Take those chances when you can. Live lives that prompt people to ask questions and then talk to them. Let us join together now in the world peace prayer. Lead us, O oh God. Lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. Be with us all this day and all our days. Amen. Amen.